Welcome back. I'm Barry Craig. If you are a fan of law and order and police shows like I am, you've got to ask yourself just how realistic is this? Well, my guest today is going to talk about that and his course here at the college called Death Investigations. He is Gary Reese, formerly of the Paducah Police Department and now a professor on our campus. Welcome to the program. Glad to be here and honored to be here. First question. I know you watch Law and Order. <laughs> I mean, don't police watch those shows? Well, how realistic was it? I think Law and Order uh, was probably a little more realistic than some of the other police shows. Um, it, it Law and Order seemed to deal mostly with the courtroom and the things that that went on in the courtroom, uh, and uh, it, it focused on the court side of it as opposed to the uh, crime scene and the forensic part of it. And uh, so I think it was probably a little more realistic. I know, I know they, uh, I watched that show some and I enjoyed that show. My wife loved that show. And uh, I, I know that they had, they had consultants and, and you know, they had plenty of exper experts that were uh, helping them with all that. So, so I, I think uh, Law and Order probably uh, was a little more realistic than some of the other CSI sort of shows. Right. And of course, they were homicide detectives. Uh, there was always there, a murder yes, uh, of uh, some kind. Of yes. So, to then segue into your your your, your class, death investigations. Uh, right. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the course uh, is obviously death investigations, and we look primarily. There's there's really four types of uh, ways or manners of death. Uh, you classify death as either natural, uh, accident, suicide, or homicide, and those those are the four. Uh, and we, we focus primarily on, in, in this course, we focus primarily on homicide and we do look at equivocal deaths or those deaths where you're not really sure uh, what, the, what the manner is. And uh, so we look at that and we look at suicides. So that's, mm -hmm. that's mainly what we try to focus on. Well, again, drawing from your background as a police officer, <laughs> you get a call, uh, someone has been shot, probably dead. You arrive on the scene, What's the first thing you all do? Well, the, the, the very first priority uh, whenever uh, officers arrive is, is to, to make sure that everyone's, you know, if they're not deceased, they're okay, or at least they check for life. Uh, usually an EMT, uh, per, uh, emergency manager, or medical technician will come in. Uh, they'll call for the ambulance, uh, even if, if uh, they're, you know, if someone's been there for a long time, it's, a lot of times it's pretty obvious. But if it's if it's a, a uh, someone that hasn't been there long, they haven't been deceased very long, then most of the time they're going to call for an EMT. So the first, the very first thing they have to do is is to care for the injured, uh, check to make sure that uh, you know this person, uh, you know if they can provide medical help, uh, then then they will do so. That's the first thing. And then and then there's a lot. It really depends on uh, the circumstances. But a lot of a lot of death scenes, uh, especially ones that have just occurred. Uh, there's a lot of hysteria there. You know, you've got folks, you may have family in the room and uh, you may have uh, neighbors or, you know, people, witnesses and all that saw things. <clears throat> so the, the first, one of the first things besides providing the medical attention is the, the officers have to get control of the situation. So they have to start working through that and they, they need to take uh, the people out of the crime scene uh, they try to. T are, are they trained to do that? Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. Um, and they get uh, officers get quite a bit of training in criminal investigations, and uh, so uh, they get quite a bit of training in interviewing, which is part of the whole process. Uh, you know, they have to when they get there, they have to conduct preliminary interviews with the the people that are there. Um, so they they get quite a bit of training in that as well. Mm -hmm. And so then once you get that situation in hand, what's the next thing? To start looking for clues? Well, that you're sort of looking for clues all along. So it's not, it's hard to uh, look at the preliminary investigation as a, as a step by step process because a lot of these things are going on at the same time. While you're waiting, for example, for the ambulance, uh, you know, you've got to start securing the crime scene and thinking about the evidence because if there's if there's a bloody footprint, for example, that might be that might be a clue uh, that's near the body, uh, then you've got to preserve that. So you don't want the ambulance rolling their uh, uh, 
stretcher across and right through that bloody footprint. So, so those are things that you really have to look at and uh, take in consideration. Um, so, so you, you're you're doing all this together, uh, pretty much at the same time. But, but, but there are basic steps that has to be done. You have to make sure the first priority is the safety and welfare of, of the people and, mm -hmm. and, and the injured, if you can provide medical attention. And then, of course, if, if there's a perpetrator there, um, then uh, if that person just uh, obviously committed a homicide, then uh, that person is dangerous. So, so to protect others from this individual, you need to take that person in custody, provided you have, provided you have the evidence to do so. And then, uh, and then the idea is, is that you, uh, once you've kind of gotten control of the crime scene, you've gotten pretty much everyone out uh, away from the crime scene, uh, then you actually like rope it off, you barricade it off, and then, it's, and then the next step would be to actually search for clues. Mm -hmm. Are you going to use uh, your experience in this class, bring in actual cases that you worked? Uh, I have... I do. I, I do. A lot of my classes that I teach in criminal justice, uh, I try to relate real life experiences to that. So, so a lot of a lot of the times, uh, I'll, I'll bring up case studies and things that I've done, or if, for example, I do a mock crime scene, uh, it may be similar to something that I've worked. Uh, if I do a mock uh, interrogation or something, it may be the scenario might be loosely connected to something I've done. So, so I do rely quite a bit on my experience. Can you, without obviously, for instance, the, the details, talk about maybe three or four of your most memorable homicides you worked as a police officer? Well, uh, I can. Uh, I, I guess the, the one of the first ones that I worked, I actually, I was involved in quite a few as a patrol officer. Uh, one of the first ones I worked as a, as a detective was uh, a, a, a elderly lady was was burned to death down on 28th street and uh we uh i was i was a new detective basically i was working night shift we had detectives on night shift back in those days and um <clears throat> we i was nervous you know that's my first oh, sure first homicide that i was responsible for and uh, uh so i was trying to do everything right and and of course you don't you don't work a uh homicide in a vacuum so to speak you you work it with other people and so you know we had the fire marshal there so i worked in conjunction with the fire marshal and in the corner you know you, you, you the corner's there and i was we've been very fortunate in this county uh, we've got dan sims who's a very knowledgeable uh corner and knows much more about death than i do and then Jerry Byer was here oh, for yeah. a long time. Sure. Jerry Byer, uh, and yeah. you talk about stories, Dan. That, that guy could tell you some oh, stories I'm sure too. Could, but yeah. I've, I've worked a lot and learned a lot from from those guys. Um, but but they but uh, they they were the coroner was there, and so um, you know we the, the the odd thing that happened in that case was the, uh, the these were juveniles that did this, and they walked back to the crime scene and they were walking down the street. And I noticed them walking across the street, and I said something to them, and, and I said, uh, and I thought maybe they were witnesses, and I thought maybe they had seen something. So I, I, I thought, well, there's some witnesses, let me check. Well, I noticed right off that they kind of acted like they wanted to avoid me and, and not, not talk, so I, I knew, well, that's a flag, you know. That's a, that's a clue, so to speak. So uh, anyway, we, to make a long story short, uh, we started doing interviews with those, and they wound up confessing to the, to the homicide. And uh, they were their their motive was to rob. They they knew the the lady had money stashed in her house, and I guess instead of putting it in the bank, she uh, she stashed quite a bit. So, uh, but that was one of them. And, and there there's there's several. So others. did they did the, was the arson was that to try to cover their crime? Arson was was an accident. Arson was. Uh, they were trying to get into the house, and the, the lady had the doors tied shut with nylon cord. And so they were using a lighter to try to burn through the cord. Oh. They could get the door open just a little bit, and they were trying to use the lighter to burn the cord so they could get the rest of the way in the house. Well, you know how nylon does oh, when yeah. you set it on fire, it starts dripping. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And she had papers and stuff everywhere, and it started dripping on those papers. And, and so it, the, the arson was an accident. Wow. So, 
Wow. It was part of the, just part of the robbery. Yeah. So. Any others you can think of? Well, probably, I, I guess, you know, the ones that stick out in my mind are the ones that are kind of, uh, none of them are happy cases, right. obviously. And uh, the, the child, the child uh, fatalities stick out in my mind. We had uh, one, probably one of the first cases that was ever televised uh, in, in McCracken County. It was uh, televised on a cable. Uh, and uh, Mark Bryant was the uh, prosecutor in those days, and uh, he prosecuted that case. But it was a little four-year-old child that was uh, abused, and um, they, um, the, the child um, um, had apparently problems with, uh, you know, potty training and all that. So there was some problems there, and it irritated the the boyfriend of the the mother mm -hmm. and so uh there was abuse that came out of that and uh, the child was really severely injured all over um i mean just I mean, there wasn't hardly a place on his body that didn't have an injury and uh they what they did was um whenever he did something he wasn't supposed to do instead of inflicting more injuries they had a bucket of water and so they started dunking the child's head in the water, and they shook the child. And eventually, God. between the the uh, water and the lungs uh, uh, and the shaken baby syndrome, mm -hmm. um, then uh, he the, the child died. And uh, that was uh, like I said, that that was probably one of my also one of my first homicides mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was pretty memorable. Uh, it kind of stands out. Mm -hmm. So it seems that there are awful lot of homicides involving uh, infidelity and lovers and all that sort of thing. Is that kind of the... Uh, <laughs> that kind of, yeah, well, you know, in Kentucky, there, there, there's, this, there's an old saying, uh, the quicker somebody gets shot is to mess the man's wife or his dog, not necessarily in that order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'm sure that's true in your native Tennessee yeah. as well. But <laughs> is that, you got a lot of domestic, I always thought as a police officer the worst possible call would be in a domestic dispute because you got the husband and wife going at each other. That's the true. poor police yeah. officer shows up and they start clubbing him, you yeah. know. Yeah, you, you been, in, been in those situations, <clears throat> uh, you know, they call the, the wife would call the police or the, or the girlfriend would call the police and you get there and then you, uh, you take, you, you know, you do your job, and if there's evidence, you take the person in custody, and the next thing you know, you've got the, you've got the person on your back or <laughs> some family yeah. member. Oh, yes, yes, that it's happens. A, yeah. yeah, humans are, are crazy. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, in, in the, you mentioned setting up a crime scene. Uh, how uh -huh. do you do that? Uh, do you, where, where on campus do you do that? Well, we've done it several different places. It really depends on the weather. Uh, I like to do outdoors, um, so we'll do them out here where the amphitheater is sometimes. Uh, I've done them out like in the parking lot and I've actually there back when I was an adjunct uh, I would have them over my house and we would do uh, crime scenes like in my garage and things like that uh, and they they liked that my, my wife sweet sweet lady she would fix cookies and <laughs> things like that and so the students enjoyed that uh, but now, well, now on a crime scene is it is it a murder scene or, or a robbery or what kind of crime do you set up is a murder scene and uh, it's it's usually not anything really complicated. You you put a you put a body out there, you know, and and put some evidence, throw some evidence around. A, a volunteer body or a dummy or no, what? a dummy body. Oh, a dummy. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. I've yeah. Uh, I've used the uh, nursing departments. I've used uh, one of their do uh, dolls, I guess you call yeah. them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mannequins. mannequins. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. I've used them before, and um, uh, I've I've used a. Uh, other kind of mannequin things and then just you know my daughter's got these little toy things so i've i've made corpses out of that kind of stuff so yeah. just whatever we can get our hands on very creative yeah. so how are they tested i mean did the, the individual is a group they, how, how do you how do you grade well them I, I try to uh i try to d organize them in a team and and certain individuals have certain responsibilities you have the crime scene security team so to speak and then you have the uh, photography team and I try to I try to break it down into the the typical tasks that uh, would have to occur during a crime scene and uh, then you have the evidence collectors and and all that sort of thing and I don't I don't grade them I I, I do have a test that on that section later so it's like a multiple multiple choice mm -hmm. true false but I don't actually 
grade them on that practical exercise. The, the, the practical exercise is really uh, a way that I try to uh, get them to take the things we've talked about in class and apply it to real life situations. Mm -hmm. So that's the You also one. mentioned suicide and uh, more than a few police shows, it, 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 it's, a, it's actually a murder made to look like a suicide. Mm -hmm. Have you run across any of that in your police work? Uh, no, I haven't that I remember, uh, and I think I would remember that. Uh, we've um, um, had, you know, there, there's been such situations where, you know, you're not really clear and you may have a, like a double murder, and sometimes it may be hard to tell if it's a murder-suicide or a double murder or something like that. And, uh, but I don't, I don't remember having one uh, where, where it was a homicide made, made it look to be a suicide. I've, I've heard of those. Mm -hmm. Heard one in Louisville. Um, guy had uh, hooked a gun to a bungee cord and run it up his chimney. And uh, he uh, shot and killed himself. Uh, was trying to make a suicide look like a homicide. And he shot and killed himself. And uh, when, he, when he did, the uh, bungee cord pulled the uh, gun up in the chimney where the police couldn't, couldn't find it. And uh, uh, so they ruled it a homicide. And then the, the next the story is the next owners, uh, they were having problems with their flu and there's, you know, smoke going up through the chimney and they, so they called a chimney sweep sweeper out there and uh, they found the gun in the chimney. So, wow. Yeah. So that's, wow. uh, that's, but I don't, I've never worked <clears throat> anything like that. I remember again, without going into detail several years ago, uh, a murder suicide. She was a student out here mm -hmm. and uh, her, uh, I guess, boyfriend, uh, Killed her and then killed himself, mm -hmm. and that's a that's a pretty horrific thing. It is. That, it that is. Was when Jerry, Jerry Byer was coroner then. I yeah. Remember. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jerry. Jerry. And the thing about uh, Jerry, I worked with. Uh, of course, like I said, I worked with Jerry and Dan Sims and those guys, and they they can um, walk into a, a homicide scene a lot of times, and they've got the experience, and they can look at. You know, you may have a couple of bodies laying there, and a gun here, and a gun there, and they can say, "Well, this is." They can look at it and just like like that. You know, so they helped the police. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We, we, could, we couldn't have done it without them. We couldn't have done it without them. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's got a body. I mean, do you get used to seeing violent death like that? Well, uh, I guess you do. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you do. Well, you uh, know, on, on Law and Order, again, it, it's when the show starts, there's always a dead body and they'll mm -hmm. make some joke. And I've always thought they'd do that to keep them going insane. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think uh, officers and coroners and uh, people that work or have worked and work, you know, if that's their responsibility, uh, I think sometimes they do have kind of a sick, sick uh, sense of humor. But I think they but do. They, it. But they do that. It's a coping. I, a I think coping it's a coping. Thing. Oh, yeah. I do. I think mm -hmm. they do that because if you if you get too emotionally involved, right. it, it would just. Oh, I can't imagine the yeah. thing. And I've always. Uh, felt sorry for state police, especially who have to come up on a wreck scene and mm -hmm. somebody's been torn to pieces and they're the first people to see it. That's, yeah. that's got to have an effect on yeah. you. Uh, yeah, year, years ago uh, <coughs> when we started with the old uh, VHS cameras, uh, and, and I'm sure they still have to do this today, they have to watch their audio. Because while they're video recording the crime scene, then you know, you've got, you may have guys joking or one thing or another back and forth and then you've got that on yeah you've got that recorded right and then when it goes to court uh, you got a problem because uh, you have a jury that may think well these guys are goofing off and they're not taking this case seriously right and uh, what they what they really don't understand it's uh, I think it is kind of a co way to cope with with that kind of work so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So getting back to your clients so so what do you look or oh, I'm mean, obvious I guess it's an obvious suicide or, a uh, person's dead and, and you can see the pistol in the hand. But there again, in, in these police shows, they'll put a pistol in somebody's hand or they'll do oh. something. And it's, it's uh, yeah. So uh, are there obvious signs of suicide? There are. Um, uh, obviously, uh, if it's a cutting, for example, uh, a lot of times they, there might be hesitation marks. So that, that's a, it's where someone would try to you know, might cut themselves a few times to, and then finally go for the the final, final jab. Uh, so that's 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 common. That's not always present, but that's that's an indicator of a suicide. Uh, even with gunshots, uh, you know, you may have a uh, situation where a person would test fire a bullet, and it's kind of like a hesitation wound. They would 
test fire it. And so a lot of times you might have even a suicide, you might have a, uh, a shot through the wall and uh, uh, which, you know, you, you might think, well, that's an indicator that it's a homicide. There was a gun fired and somebody missed. Uh, but that's not always the case. A lot of times there might be a test shot to, to go with that and then the person would turn the gun uh, on themselves and, and do that. Uh, suicide notes are, you know, it, it'd be good if an officer could find a suicide note and, you know, that helps to clarify things as long as you could verify that it's a, uh, a true note. Uh, but the problem with that is uh, only about uh, most suicides I, I worked, uh, they, they did not have suicide notes. And I think statistically, um, it seems like I remember seeing 20, 20, just a little, maybe a little over 20% of suicides, the uh, person actually has a, leaves a suicide note. So, so you can't always go by that. Um, you know, if there, there's talk and I, I I've never seen uh, the, and, and there's um, controversy, not controversy, there's, there's disagreement as to whether or not there is such a thing as a death grip. You know, it's called a cadaveric spasm, where a person, if they hold a gun, uh, then, uh, and they shoot themselves, and they've got this death grip on that gun. Uh, I've not seen that, and I've read the literature on it, and I think there's disagreement as to whether or not that's, that's true. And of course, you have uh, rigor mortis, which is different than the, mm -hmm. than the death grip, because rigor mortis goes through the whole body. Um, and that so, takes a while to set in. Yeah, it usually starts about, uh, from what I understand, it starts about two to three hours after, and it really depends on the temperature and the conditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it starts two to three hours after death, and it starts with uh, the smaller muscles, like in the fingers, and then uh, it goes into the bigger muscles after that, and then it kind of, it goes back out pretty much the same way it came in, and usually the whole process takes 24 to 36 hours, I believe. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. And that's, that's a good rigor mortis, and there's other signs like that that are good to help uh, establish time of death um, and, and so forth and so on. And, and, you know, you can use, back to your thing about suicides, uh, you know, if a person has rigor, uh, sometimes you might be able to tell whether the body's been moved because if you come in and the body's in a, in a, in a position that's unnatural for where, where it's at, uh, you know, then that might be an indicator it's a homicide if the body's been moved. So, so there, there's a lot of little indicators like that that can help an investigator determine the difference between a homicide and suicide. Well, again, going back to your class, are you going to also look at uh, natural death and accidental death? Is that all part of it? No, we uh, we talk about we t we don't talk about natural death at all, right. uh, really. Uh, but we talk a little bit about accidental death, and, and really the only way we the only way we refer to that is is that if you, you treat all deaths, especially until you know what manner it is, you treat all deaths as if it's a homicide, mm -hmm. and that's 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 the point that. Uh, I think it's very important for um, investigators and students that that, are, that you know are looking to be investigators down the road, and uh, so you have to treat them all whether it's an accident. Now, a lot of accidents are pretty obvious, uh, but at the same time, you don't know how they got into that accidental state. Well, you, you, know. you go back to a show like Columbo. There's an automobile accident, and they investigate <clears throat> on it. Somebody cut the brake lines. Yeah. the car was sabotaged. Right. So all that, yeah, right. I think that would make sense that yeah. you think this is this is a homicide. Right, right, and that's what you do. And uh, and you know, if you do, if you do, uh, it, and it's really better uh, as an investigator to do everything you can do up front, and then think, you know, two or three weeks down the road, well, I wasted my time, but you know, that's just the way it is. And uh, instead of doing shoddy work up front, and then finding out later somebody cut the brake line and then you've, you've, you know, there's things you didn't fingerprint the car, you didn't do, there's a lot of things you didn't do that you should have done and that now you can't go back and do because everybody right. and their cousin's been right. nailing the car since then. So, so it's better to do too much than not enough. It is, it is. That's, that's always kind of been my philosophy with that. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Now, to get in your class, do they have to take a, a intro class, or is this? No, it's it's a uh, my this class is uh, actually this is the first time that I've taught this, and it's a it's an elective. So anybody you know you you would just get elective credit for it. It's not a required. It's not a general ed course, um, and uh, I uh, 
so there's no there's no prereq for it. I would think if you know someone were were a fan of police shows, they would really enjoy this, yeah. uh, especially the over 65s. You know, they're yeah. always looking for courses <laughs> to take. It's a fascinating course, yeah. and, and again, watching television, seeing these movies. Uh, of course, I've always thought that th that the criminal genius is pretty rare. Mm -hmm. that, that most crimes are committed by not, yeah. <laughs> not the, oh, uh, uh, Moriarty is, is not typical. Yeah. Sherlock Holmes is nemesis. They're mostly in, and I remember uh, <clears throat> from my days at the Paducah Sun uh, hearing some of these stories. Uh, my all time favorite, though, it, 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 it's, there was a break in at, at a hardware store uh, in Lone Oak, and uh, they found uh, that well, they'd stolen a sledgehammer and they broke open the drive-in one at one of the fast food restaurants. They mm -hmm. went in there and they yeah. found the sledgehammer. It's yeah. like, and they probably stole $12. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, you know, yeah. if you're going to do something, there's still a lot of money yeah. if you're going to yeah. do it. Yeah. But I'm, I'm sure you, you ran across some really not, oh, yeah. not criminal geniuses. Right, right. And, and you know, we had a, I had an investigator uh, back when I was a supervisor of investigations in the, uh, Great, great investigator, and his name is Eric Jackson. And uh, but Eric was one of those that he was just apt to say most anything, and uh, but did a great, great job. And he got it in front of the media, and uh, they were talking about some crime like that. And he made the comment to the media, he said, "Well, he said if they weren't if they weren't stupid, we wouldn't catch them." <laughs> <laughs> and I, of course, I was rubbing my face. Up, right, and, oh my right, goodness, right, 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 right. But anyway, so we we did. We have a lot. We had a lot of. Uh, uh, Thank goodness we had a lot of, of criminals that uh, didn't, did, they didn't put a lot of planning into. Yeah. But you know, it gets back to what you said before, uh, most uh, violent crimes are a result of, they're, they're a crime of passion, Probably most of them are. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. and there's some that, that are not, a uh, lot, lot more seems like now because of the drug, drug issues and drug trafficking and things like that. Um, but. Uh, you know, back in the day, it was mostly, you know, 90% were probably domestic related. Somehow. Oh, yeah. I yeah. bet that statistic's pretty yeah. high even now yeah. when yeah. you think about it, too. Uh, yeah. And, and that, that leads to, um, you know, the clearance rate for murders is really pretty high, obviously pretty high because the police put a lot more emphasis uh, into the murder investigation, but also because the fact that most uh, victims know their know their perpetrator. You know, they, I've read or that. they knew their perpetrator. I've read that. that, I've read that yeah, so. So. Well, we're out of time. I hope you can come back next time we can talk some more about Love this. To, because there are some it. actual unsolved murders in this area that yeah. I recall very well. Maybe we could talk about that. Yeah. So. Give it a shot. We'll do it. <laughs> My guest today was Gary Reese. I'm Barry Craig. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank mm -hmm. you.